Greetings once again. The mystery of the intermission. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Okay. And cry unto her that her welfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. In Isaiah 40, we have the punishment and the promise of the blessing. The prophets... Uh, are in the wilderness and they're the ones who prepare the way of the Lord and they're in the desert and they make straight the way of the Lord. The cities, Jerusalem, and uh, the lesson goes to all cities, countries, peoples have been paid double for their sins. People wonder, well, there are people praying here in America, and there are godly people here, but it just seems like there has been a, uh, a payment of double for the sins of America in the past, you know, 20 years or so. And I'm here to basically... give a glimpse as to how the future unfolds. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. And the blessing continues, the promise and the mystery. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath, and I'll make the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast, they shall die of a great pestilence. And afterward, saith the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, and I'm in Jeremiah 21, uh, and his servants and the people and such as are left in the city from the pestilence, from the sword, from the famine, unto the land of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into thy hand of their enemies and in the hand of those that seek their life, and he shall smite them with the edge of the sword, and shall not spare them, neither have pity nor have mercy. Jeremiah prophesying the Babylonian captivity, which first began with a great slaughter, men, women, and children, inhabiting the enemy, inhabiting all the, all the houses and buildings, and then eventually just taking away the spoil and taking the people away to be made slaves in Babylon. A lot of levels to this. But the point of this scripture is to understand that children are not spared. And what may seem unbelievably harsh is not that harsh. What may seem double considering the iniquity is not harsh because the Lord will not spare his own people nor have pity nor have mercy when the chastisement comes. And for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh will burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. 
And of course, that's Malachi 4. But Elias will, will truly come and restore to you all things, but I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, also the Son of Man will suffer of them. If God did not spare his own son, did not spare his favorite prophet Elijah, in the form of Elijah and John the Baptist, what right have anyone to complain who says, I am of the Lord. I'm waiting to be rescued. Now, I'm not going to pick a fight with the, you know, the, the, <laughs> the R people. I'm, that's not my intention here. What I'm saying is, when the horrors come and people just can't believe how evil they're being treated and instead start dissociating, going into trauma based on dissociation. In other words, being split in their personalities from the trauma of the abuse being inflicted, which is double and, and, and no child is spared, no matter how innocent. Those who are left intact will be carried away to Babylon Those who remain with the word, remain with the Lord, will be rewarded in riches of the earth and they will be sent to make habitation and to expand in all cities and all countries in the world and will take root as the res restoration takes place, which will be symmetrically sevenfold of blessing beyond what that which is deserved. In other words, what is deserved may be a little blessing for loyalty. But what comes is sevenfold restoration. And Jesus said, Whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear uh, in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And this pertains now prophetically to the truth coming out, which causes a desperation and a hurrying to hurry up and do the deed, which is to clamp down and put the people in bondage completely, Completely. Completely. Around the world. And so to make sense of this. Via the Holy Spirit. I believe that. What is to come. Is always mixed the blessing and the curse, the elation and the foreboding, the joy and the sorrow, the unfairness and the fairness, the ridiculous fairness and the ridiculous unfairness, and all in all, Christ being the rock, we are to maintain steadfastly this is the utterance of the lamb to lion transformation. There is um, something to be said for meekness, of course. But there's a time for leadership. And the lamb ethos, if you will, that is Yahweh separates you from the world for himself for his purpose and pleasure. And um, this situation is um, not something of uh, human 
effort, that of being separated, because being separated is something that cannot be done by a human being to himself. You can separate yourself from evil people, I suppose. You can separate yourself from the ways of the world, I suppose. But that is not really true separation, because along with separation has to be sanctification, and we cannot sanctify ourselves. Christ, in Christ we are sanctified, washed by his blood we are sanctified, and no other place are we sanctified. And in that we are justified, that we can stand before God in holiness and without sin, because he is without sin. He, Jesus, Yeshua, Habashiach, the Lord, that is without sin. And that gives us standing legally with the Lord and puts us on, um, you know, uh, even footing with all brethren. There is no one above or below you. No one who has more experience than you or less because in the spirit we are all equally knowledgeable. There is no hierarchy that can be gleaned amongst the lambs and the lambs are separate in the sense that they themselves go into their situations alone. They don't coalesce in a group of, say, lambs. That, that doesn't seem to be what has happened. They go two by two, in many cases, husbands and wives, little kids, whatever, but they go into those lion's dens. <laughs> they go into those dens. They go into the world. And the point is to be a light unto the truth of the Lord, because there's no point in going and turning the lamp off or basking in darkness. For someone who is exposed to the light, this is anathema and not possible. Anathema and not possible. Once you've seen the light, even once, basking in darkness becomes... Um, Certainly it's possible to mistake the darkness for the light. But it really is not practical to think along those lines. And I have to prepare myself another coffee since this is coming to you at 3.37 a.m. I don't mind making you wait because I had to wait. You have to wait. I too have to wait. And what do we wait on, children? We wait upon the Lord's moving in our lives. When I went outside for confirmation today, I stood under the stars, beautiful morning, 3 a.m., just beautiful with the stars, perfect temperature, must be 70 degrees. And um, I gave praise to Almighty Yahweh, God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, right at that moment, as I stretched my hands toward the firmament, Right in that moment, a shooting star right over my head. Right, right over my hands. There must be something here. Oh, it's askew. That's dangerous. Just as I stretched my hands forth, a shooting star, and then I said, thank you, Lord. And as if to answer that, another right on the heels of that, directly overhead, just boom and boom. And <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking. Maybe it wasn't uh, a star. Well, whatever it was, it was communicating with me directly. Uh, of course, I've had the same thought that it was no star. I've had the same thought that indeed it was some sort of manifestation 
a communication of just saying hello, acknowledging that I stretched my hands forth to the firmament and said, praise you, Lord, and whew, right overhead, as if to answer, and then I said something else, and then whew, to, to make sure that I got the first one, that the timing on it could not be mistaken. And it also gave me a sign and an unction to go forth with the word today. Because it was just right on cue. It wasn't, I mean, you know, you go out there for two minutes and it's right on cue. It's not like I'm standing there waiting for something. I communicate to God, putting my hands up toward the heavens toward the stars. I utter something and the response is a very bright star flying across, you know, a star, a, a meteor, a comet, a, not a comet, but a meteor could have been, but whatever, God can move those things as if to say, hello, my son, I acknowledge that you just uttered praise to me and I'm saying hello back to you, go forth. And so that I knew in my heart that I could speak today. So the bittersweet pill of being cursed and blessed and complaining about the curses and then basking in the blessings and calling the curses unfair um, there's been a lot of fairness even beyond that of the children of Israel. In their disobedience, God said, do not spare nor have mercy upon them after you get done killing them. People forget about this. They think that um, the Babylonians just came in and, uh, you know, rounded them up. It wasn't like that. It's more like they killed men, women, and children. And then what was left was rounded up. And um, that can really help to turn someone's faith um, aside if you're one of those people. And now I'm gay, yeah, okay. And then we get into the, the whole thing of the, I hate to say it, the R word, you know, the rapture. And the people almost seem to me to be and they're waiting, and it's like the, if anything bad happens to them, they just couldn't handle it. They would say, but I thought we were going to be taken out before this kind of thing would happen. I mean, surely the church, I mean, that was the Old Testament. Surely God wouldn't, you know, I mean, the people that have been on the course, uh, he's not going to punish them with the wicked even if he's punishing the churches that have fallen and gone the wrong way. And if you see that happening, what, what happens? Well, your faith is tried and you feel like you don't deserve it and you feel like it's, uh, you know, it's, you must have done something wrong and maybe you never had faith and it just sends you into a kind of a, a downward spiral because after all, you're the beloved bride and you've done your best to be spotless and you've done the best despite what country you're in and how evil, you know, the people that run things in the world are evil. I mean, I, I, it's really just very simple. And we have talk shows and news and things that complain about the corruption, but in order to get to be one of those people that's in charge, you have to corrupt yourself and get into one of their guilds, you know, as a young man and work your way up to where you get your shot, and th that means doing lots of bad things on the way to vet yourself. In my book, Lamb, I even have a guy killing his own family in a satanic ritual and having an orgy over it to boost himself politically. And now, of course, you realize, a few years ago, that sounded preposterous. People label me as nuts. And now, of course, now that a lot has been exposed, which was the other part of this rhema today, is that Everything that's kept in secret has been exposed the last 10 years. Knowledge, as it says in Daniel 12, has been increased greatly. There is nothing held in secret that people don't know about. It's just they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to think it's that bad or the thing they're part of is just that bad. And then, 
But the ones who are innocent, you know, to the pure, all things are pure, as the Apostle says. So you must understand that the, the pure don't really deal with all that kind of heavy thing. They see it in a pure light, and, and you know, it's just, it's, you know, they don't relate to it um, like they could be part of it. They just see it, and it's like watching a horror movie or something. They don't feel they're, they're watching it, but they don't feel that they are a part of it. And um, these people were kept innocent by the Lord, and they don't know about the other side. You know, the other side. What, what the, the Satanists feel that their other side is held secret, and they can nod and wink at each other, and it's all cool. You know, like to get in the music business, you have to go to the other side and make your moves and hopefully you'll get a uh, your shot someday after playing by the, as Bill Clinton said, the rules. And of course we, we know what he means by that. Well, he used to say things like that. I mean, that's ancient history. But laced in all these political speeches, you hear double entendres intended to speak to their own beloved brethren on the other side, which of course is becoming the most pathetic position on earth to have ever been in in the first place. Not only is it pathetic, but it's completely stupid. Uh, it's stupid like walking out on the freeway and being run over. Perhaps your flesh is gratified for a minute, uh, power and position you feel you have, but you know it's an eternity of suffering, plus you die a second death while on earth. Before you even die, you're dead. Demons take you over. You who was there aren't even there. You become a sock puppet and you do and say and speak like a dog. And yes, you get to be a senator or a president or whatever as a result. But it's not you who actually occupies the office in the end. Right? I think that's pretty clear, isn't it? And so the people who are not part of that you know, other side would be um, either lost, you know, they're lambs to the slaughter for sure, but that doesn't mean they're God's lambs. These innocent ones are slain along with the wicked evildoers. The future that comes is what we said in 2008. There'll be a clamping down of um, free speech on the internet. There'll be a ramping up of the police state globally because these people are, it's, it's not them doing it. Again, it's the demonic realm that is obsessed with surveillance. You know, the idea of killing people from the sky of your list, whoever you want, I used to think that would happen via satellite. But now I see, um, you know, how they've used drones to take out whole families. And when Obama has done this, he's killed women and children along with the target. And he's done it himself, having some sort of glee. Many people are starting to think, as I have speculated, and I'll still call it speculation, that Obama fulfills the requirements in the book of Daniel for the Antichrist, the man of sin, the, the one who speaks great blasphemies against the Most High, which he has done publicly on numerous occasions, and who will make war and ultimately be defeated, and there will be none left to help him. He will go and be defeated. Now, let's say he's a template, or this is a precursor of an Antichrist. Fine, I don't care what you say. The pattern would be, prophetically, that he would go to make war, he would attack whoever he likes, he will ultimately, and he, and he had to be a betrayer of Israel, which he is, but he lies, he's a liar. He is no friend of women, we, knew, we understood from, there's enough evidence, of course, to suggest that, you know, what he has is a, a beard, you know, an arranged marriage, an arranged children, but that's not who he is. He is not a friend of women being that he is uh, gay or whatever. He even calls himself the first gay president, and the, and the irony of that is, but they don't really realize he really is gay. People say, well, he may be bi, but 
the, the, the point is, I think the preference is what he grew up with, how he was initiated at Punahou School, how he came along. He, he's, uh, most of the people on the other side, in fact, all of them, have to at least be, you know, bi. Because it's, sex is a big thing with Satan. I mean, it's, it may not be a big thing to you or me. Like, you, you go, well, why do you want that? What is that? What do you mean? If I do this, you'll do that. If I do that, you'll do... If I give you this piece of flesh, then you do this for me. You know, there's that quid pro quo kind of thing. But, you know, you can, you can <clears throat> argue it all you want, but that's the way it is. So he was seen giving the Masonic handshake upon graduation from Punahou. And, you know, his whole life has almost been a blueprint uh, to fulfill these prophecies. And, and uh, some people say, but that wouldn't be <clears throat> the case because he would be beloved. And I, and I say, well, not necessarily. But if you look at the growing number of people who, who have, he has a certain mystique, a certain cult of personality. But let's get away from the idea of calling someone, the specific someone in something, because this is all existing outside of time and inside of time. Time expands and contracts. The, the, the mystery of the word of God is that the word of God is a mystery. You can't glean from the scriptures times and dates. Have you learned that? <laughs> How many times have you been burned, huh? Well, the people that set times and dates and, you know, and are anticipating something that's going to happen end up waiting forever. That's the point. But those who just bask in the light and aren't thinking about things, they seem to be uh, events one after the other seem to happen to them. Dun, da, dun, da, da. Here's an event almost on a daily basis. There's some big moving of God and they're being caught up in it. And it's happening to them. They don't, they're not waiting for something. They're, they're not waiting at all. They're in this timeless time while on earth and things just seem to be happening. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because they're not looking behind and they're not looking ahead. They're satisfied in the present as, as much as possible. They're giving praise and thanks for everything that they can, you know, when they can. You know, we don't always feel good, right? But I mean, you know, sometimes just giving praise and thanks when you don't feel good brings about a feeling of feeling good. And so... The template, I would say, Obama has fulfilled that template, which means making war and pissing off um, enemies like uh, Putin and others, you know, because he's, he looks like a bumbling fool, but he's bumbling with design. You know, they have prophets in the form of sorcerers. They have t timetables. They are obsessed with time. They're obsessed with times and dates and numbers. And so they have a schedule, and Obama is fulfilling their schedule of bringing about this World War III because he's a Mason, and Albert Pike explained it, uh, so that there could be this new world order. And so he would agree with Putin, nod, nod, wink, wink, both Masons, um, that we will go ahead and you know, get to an emergency status and the groundwork's already been laid for this so that we can escalate it all up and then we can have a, a uh, an exchange. Better not get rid of all the nukes because we're going to need some. And on and on and on. And then the, the other utterance is the idea of this Babylonian captivity. In other words, the infiltration of the United States, the displacing of people out of their homes, Foreigners occupying their homes and businesses. New language even being brought in to the point where the Americans are no longer there is more the plan not to enslave the Americans, but to, through attrition, assimilation, through enforced cultural norms, through the police state, eventually the idea is to uh, create a slave engine and um, so there's this idea that, that World War III must exist, must happen 
in order for there to be this conclusion. And Obama is the point man bringing about, you saw how he has um, hypnotized so many people to go along with his um, uh, stealth Marxist communist uh, health care reform, which is basically, uh, now we find out from Judge Roberts that uh, who voted in favor of upholding the mandate, we find out that it's called a tax. And so the American people were once again deceived and um, they were told that it was, was not a tax. And they voted on it on the basis of health care reform and not a tax. And now we're told that it's the biggest tax hike in world history. That was to, You see how it was all done with deception. And Judge Roberts now is completely tainted. He's corrupt, he's disgusting and despicable. And, you know, what he intended for evil, Judge Roberts, that is, who sold out, who sold the soul of the devil, he is an out-and-out -out Satanist. 100% with his brother, Obama. Nod, nod, wink, wink, part of the same Brotherhood Secret Society. You seeing how it works? I mean, you know, you know all this, but I mean, the way I'm connecting it. And so... People still don't really know what to make of it. The, the point is there's nothing to make of it. It's the same thing as when a, uh, a brother goes into uh, a courtroom accused of murder and the evidence is there, but it all hinges on one witness. And if they're fellow brothers, fellow travelers, that witness does not testify against his fellow traveler, period. Or if there's legislation up, the judge w the, the, uh, will not go against him because this is the plan. They'll make it look like, oh, they were really going to say, oh, he didn't know what he was doing. Oh, you know, but it will be out and out corruption. And um, Judge Roberts is, at least now, in the realm of truth, has evinced himself as just a dirty, corrupt, despicable individual just like Obama, just like most politicians, just like people who worship the devil. Because they worship the devil, they're so short-sighted and they're so ignorant. You would think a man of that kind of education and supposed wisdom would have not taken a bow to the devil publicly of course, the media and everyone covers it up. There's no such thing as anything like what I just said. And, and so he kind of gets a pass, and the history will be kind to him because the same people in the same brotherhood write the history books. So, you know, it's kind of like, well, who saw it? Well, I saw it. And I'm witnessing about it. I mean, I'm witnessing for Christ, but I'm witnessing about what I'm shown in the Spirit. Now, what he may have intended for evil has been uh, God will use for good. There will be some sort of respite. There is a restoration, and there has been a punishment, folks. Over the last 30, 40, 50 years, there has been a great punishment. What's the punishment? The people have gone to the devil. Their nation has been infiltrated by foreign enemies. The enemies of the Constitution hold the highest office in the land. They have been occupied, and now the police state has come down on them, and the IRS and everything else, to keep them in a slave. They have been enslaved in America. They have had this punishment. They have not had good medical care. In other words, the joke about health care is, uh, yeah, uh, and the worst thing you could do is go to the hospital. They're mandating health care so that they can force vaccines on you and, you know, so they can kill you, you know, on cue. That's all part of the plan, too, because the people that are running the show here and running health care are eugenicists. Absolutely, there's no question about that. I mean, no question for those who have eyes to see. There's obviously um, people that don't, can't receive this, you know, revelation or direct revelation of truth, can't handle it. And, you know, they look for 
they go back to the print journalism or read something on Facebook and they have a certain reality that's 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 manufactured that that will make them feel okay about being here but there's something gnawing at them what's gnawing at you my friends is the fact that you just can't call it gloom and doom and say it's over and you can't say break out the champagne either but I tell you this there's a lot of people praying well I know this is not the message you want to hear and so there will be a respite and a restoration of sorts, beginning with the saints, the real ones, the ones who may not necessarily wear Yeshua on their sleeves, but they just are that way. They just are like that. You know, I can't explain it. They're just that, for whatever reason. And they may not be aware of themselves. Restoration means joy in one's heart and when one is in love, one does not see um, the satanic. One is not enslaved by Janet Napolitano and her goons. How embarrassing it would be to be her, you know? What an embarrassing thing to stand before God and go, this is what I did with my life. Can you imagine? Ah! Well, not that I have much more to say about it, about mine, but I'm just saying that would be something I wouldn't want to, you know, I'm here to enslave the people. And, you know, ultimately what I really want is, you know, I want drones to fly over their houses. And if they're not doing them, if they're doing something wrong, I want to come arrest them. You know, I don't even want to just be in the plane stations or the airports. I need to be in the checkpoints and on on the border and I need I need oh I need to be in the car with a monitor and then I want to be in their homes and I ultimately you know me I Janet Napolitano I must be in their bedrooms and, and the, no even further beyond their sex I've got to be in their minds because what if they're thinking their wrong thought then we can arrest them before they ever ever execute any of those thoughts I need to be in their guts, in their soul. I need to be up their bums. I need to be in their veins. Well, I'm still, and I'm still not satisfied. There could be something going on in there we don't know. Maybe it's best if we killed them because then there wouldn't be any problem. You understand? That's the consciousness that produces the ethos, which is the police state mentality. Right? They don't even trust the blood pumping. They have to maybe monitor that. There could be something in those veins that, because oh, we're looking for DNA. That, the DNA of lambs, of angels. Angelic beings in human form have certain DNA signatures, certain blood types, and we've, we've got to find them. That, that's the problem. If we could just get rid of them, then we could have the planet. In other words, Ultimately, if we could have a world without God, and we could just, you know, monitor everyone until we could just root that out, then we can be happy. Okay? Now, that mentality is no more pronounced than in Marxism, right? The ultimate surveillance. And also, note the rise of psychiatrists again. On my Facebook page... I believe I'm Zed Ja, Z E T J A H on Facebook. Zed Ja, so you can look me up. I think I'm Zef Daniel, a la Zed Ja or whatever, I don't know. But on there, if you become my friend, you can see it. It says, um, I got an email that was for placing psychiatrists. It was like a service that, that uh, would place them, uh, that would recruit them and place them. And I, I thought it was the most bizarre email I had ever seen in my life. I put it there. So this is really strange, you know. I mean, I don't know why I was on the list. of Maybe they think I'm a psychiatrist. I don't know. But they would recruit and place you in various places. So <laughs> I just thought, you know, ooh, the rise of psychiatrists. Oh, this is a leftist wet dream here. Psychiatrist, police state, making sure people don't have something. They got some. They've got some 
oh, they've got some kind of thing they shouldn't have, or they're hoarding some food, or they've, everyone's got to be the same, and if someone's cheating, oh, we're going to root them out and execute them in the public square, by God. If they got a Bible, oh, that's it. And Islam, of course, is a tool of the left, left meaning wrong. In other words, whenever you see the word left, it means wrong. For example, when a leftist speaks about anything, it's always lies. It's always wrong. Not, not to mean when someone on the right, if politically speaks, they're always right. Because there's a, there's a, um, a position of corruption where the left and the right are moot, you know, canceled out, Hegelian dialectic, and both, you know, both sides lie. But what I'm saying is just in the spiritual sense of things, the left, let's, let's look at India for a moment. The left-handed path would be tantrism, which would be satanic ritual and satanic ritual abuse of people and children, and ultimately human sacrifice, i.e. the Kali cults in uh, India, uh, called the Thuggy. <clears throat> for those who want to look it up on Google, Thuggy, T-H-U-G-E-E. -E. And uh, you'll, you'll see these are Kali cults. Well, this is called... Um, collectively, and since I do have education in this area, it's good that I do because I can speak from knowledge. Um, th they are called the left-hand path. Tantrism, human sacrifice, and all that. That's the left-handed path. And because a lot of their activities are illegal, they learn to lie about everything. You see Obama lie. He gets caught in lots of lies. Uh, Bill Clinton was a good liar. Obama's actually not that good of a liar. He's just arrogant, and that arrogance makes people forget or he's able to hypnotize people when he speaks and they forget about how many lies he's, he's he lies just because it's like an arrogant thing i'm going to go out and lie even if i don't have to because i want to get away with it and the more i get away with it the more you are traumatized or hypnotized and the more power i get so lie 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 you understand that's a leftist right double speak right uh 1984 was about leftism it was not uh, fascism is leftism. Communism is leftism. It's rooted in the satanic. It is satanic ritual abuse for the masses. It's really simple. Um, the Bible would be conservative in the sense that the principles there would be looked at as disgustingly conservative and uptight and uncool. But it is conservative, whether you like it or not. The Bible is a conservative. The Constitution is conservative. So the leftist wants to bash it and get rid of it. It's quite simple. There is no real debate on this. It's, I mean, I'm just stating the obvious and what is. I'm not really, I'm stating facts rather than um, conjecture or rather than an opinion. Opinion means nothing to me. I'd rather be in facts. You know, and if it's an opinion, I will tell you so. This, this my opinion, meaning this is my thought about it that may or may not be accurate. So I'll call that an opinion. Opinion doesn't rise to the, to the level of truth. But, um, you know, you know how things are sing-song like children's tales? You know, left is wrong and right is right. And it's just like, sing de ding de ding de seesaw, seesaw, left is wrong and right is right. Da 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 da. You see what I mean? Little children's fairy tales, you know. It's all, it's all the truth is laced in there somehow. Um, but right just means, uh, is short for righteous. And righteous means Christ. Not our righteousness, but his. So that would be. Um, that the Bible path would be the righteous path, the narrow way, and the way of the world would be the left. And so when people are fighting the left, they don't understand that the left just represents the way of the world. Um, there were people that, uh, that I had run into who were defending the health care thing and, you know, mocking Sarah Palin and, you know, going on like that. And... So, and, and then, you know, but here's the good news. All these people have left their quasi-Jesus thing. They've left Jesus. They've gone to the amorphous Yahweh and even started to get into spiritualism. So thank God the left has gone into spiritualism. So they're easy to see. They've really gotten away from, um, you know, and if they do 
intone the Bible in any way. They they just do it to bash people who they don't agree with politically or whatever. They they use it to um, in a in a carnal way rather than speaking what the Lord wants is the word. Anyway. Righteousness would be upholding God, and, the, and, and God gives us our rights. And God gives, sheds grace on us. God gives us his land to occupy in. All the arguments that people have about, well, this was uh, belonging to uh, Indians and all that. So, yeah, and they beat the crap out of each other as well, <clears throat> taking te- stealing territories from one another. So the point is, is God gifted the land, whatever we call America, it was a God's gift to the people. And, and, and uh, otherwise, it would not have been given. And um, whether reparations are made on these, uh, you know, I'm probably not too popular with the Indian nations right now, but the point is, is, you know, there was a fight and um, they lose, just like the, the Hun in, uh, in Europe. All that uh, territory was being fought over for hundreds of years and then eventually became what you'd, you would know as the countries of Europe. But every territory there was hard fought and blood spilled. There's not, a, there's not an inch of territory in this earth where uh, a value that wasn't fought over where blood was spilled. Uh, wars for territory have gone on and on. And here before the Spaniards, before the, the white man came here in New Mexico, it was the Spanish Indian Wars. So before that, it was the Indian Indian Wars. And about that time, way before the Spanish got here, there were um, um, there were Hebrews here. Yeah, they were. Uh, they sailed over with the. Um, uh, they they you know sailed the world and. Um, wrote the, uh, the Word of God on various tablets and things, and there's evidence of that around the world, before even Indian territory. So you could say, well, this was a, a Hebrew you know, stronghold before the Indians ever got here. <laughs> and so on and on. It be, makes the whole point of land moot. It's, land is, is yours if you can protect it, because there's another guy trying to get it from you, and even now, they're trying to usurp the land of the United States by turning the people into slaves through immorality and the left-handed path. The left-handed path, which also manifests as global socialism, global Marxism, et cetera, et cetera, that path is the path of the wide path of destruction. And Hollywood, because they're not too bright in Hollywood, and you know, even big business to a certain degree, they embrace it because of the perks that they get but in the end, they pay with their souls, with their lives. So not, not wink, wink, um, between Judge Roberts and, and, and uh, Marxist Obama uh, to bring about this new world order and this global thing. At the backdrop, what's going on behind the scenes is the World War III planning. So all that is on the table, yet how come Z is talking about restoration? What the heck is Z talking about? He admits on the one hand, speaking in the third person about myself, he admits on the one hand that there is World War III on the table and every nasty thing imaginable and total slavery for the people of the United States. And by the way, before the Europeans can gloat and be excited and cheer in their stupid way about, about the enslavement of America because they just feel that there's a grudge, they're going down first. So it's... <laughs> you know, their goodies, their treats will be taken away from them. So uh, I, I don't think that um, uh, they will really be able to say much of anything about anybody in the end um, because they will be in, you know, spending most of their time in, in food lines. You know? Uh, you know, and all I can say to that is keep following the left-handed path, you're up, and you'll see where that leads. It leads to total poverty, death, and starvation, starvation and death. And that's where it led to the pilgrims. They tried to be a collectivist at one time. And they were starving and dying until finally they, they began to do diversity of labor and each one be, had to become their own business person. And then uh, the economy, a free market system, uh, took hold and they prospered. And eventually that kind of grew into you know, the colonies and, and um, you know, you know, the way of life we have here. There is Collectivism leads to poverty, and actually, if you'd like to know, 
throughout world history, genocide. In Europe, I would say that the the Islamic um, left-handed path is is Islam. So that um, is the modality of slavery for Europe will be Islam will be its undoing. And uh, they're too dumb to see it. And they're dumb not because they're stupid, because they're not. Um, they're stupid meaning blind, or if you like a better word, the best word, so we don't get into, you know, my flesh wants to say stupid idiot and all that, but, you know, the real word that Jesus used was ignorance. They're ignorant. They're ignorant, I mean, they have a form of religion, you know, uh, churchianity and whatnot, but, but uh, atheism has taken hold, and where there's atheism, then eventually there will be, uh, uh, you know, the end of the free market system, which then leads to mass death, ultimately, which is what, you know, which is also what the United States is facing. You know, Europe and the United States are facing kind of the same thing in a way, although one culture is more advanced down that path than the other, but both lead to destruction. It's very simple. God hates collectivists. God hates it when you say, I can take it from here. I can do it on my own. It's that individual crying out to the Lord that the Lord responds to and rewards. Every kind of um, economy that we've seen in the Bible, all the ones that were ongoing, and where Solomon got his wealth and so on and so forth, had to do with the free market system. And in a free market system, not everybody becomes rich. In a free market system, not every, you know, the poor are still poor. A statistic that might be interesting is that since the war on poverty that was started by Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 60s, since the war on poverty began, the same exact percentage of poor exist in America as they did on day one of Johnson. The collectivist, socialist, uh, New Deal, uh, all of that kind of stuff always fails and will continue to fail. Jesus said the poor will be with you always. There are people that don't aspire to be wealthy and then there are people who do. Well, whatever God puts in your heart to do, I, I would just do it without guilt because um, without that market, without the guy that wants to be wealthy and the guy that doesn't care about being poor, it takes all of all of that to kind of exact God's will to create something. And you can't create something when there's no freedom. You know, you end up doing what you're told to do and it's, it's, not, it's not creative. Um, I've tried to explain this to people. Why is it important I explain? Okay, there's someone that, out there that needs to hear this. So the bottom line on how um, wealth power and nations are created. Wealth, power, and nations are created from self-interest, meaning I have something to take to the marketplace to sell so I can get my bread and feed my family, okay, through that impetus, through that mechanism, okay, I, in other words, I take a risk to create something that I will take to the marketplace. And if it's something that people want, I will be rewarded and I can not only feed my family, but I can hire people to make more of those things and take more of those things to market because lots of people want them. Now we're finding out. There's another guy that had an idea, not quite as good as mine, and he's been told to go sit down and shut up where mine made me wealthy, you see? And that's the thing that the left just can't stand to see. They want everyone in the same boat, but ultimately they want everyone in the same grave. Ultimately they want everyone to have the same blood in their veins. Ultimately like everyone is to have the same thoughts and actually be the same robot. So, you know, and it ties in so well with the satanic and secret societies. It ties in so well with the Illuminati blood rituals, uh, bloodline elites, ca calculated carefully, crafted bloodlines and then sorcerers and sorceresses in the highest levels crafting these bloodlines through generations to birth the the one who will be the messiah and that messiah would ensure the death and destruction of all human beings in the rise of machines they even have nano machines that if they let them loose now 
could destroy all flesh on Earth. In fact, all, all, all biological life on Earth within about three days would be gone. And I ask you, <laughs> makes me laugh. Why hasn't that happened yet? If I was one of them and I had a weapon like that and I wanted to come back here as a virus, as Prince William said or whatever, you know what I would do is if I get a hold of one of those nano things, I'd just go ahead and get rid of all flesh on Earth uh, and all life on Earth and then we win, right? We left as collectivists. Once we get rid of all flesh and life, we win. But the first thing we have to do is make sure humans don't walk in the forest. So we have to lop those off. Oh, they're the ones that will... They, they, they want to make sure that you don't drive in and then you, you can't walk in. You can only go there with appointments. And eventually what they really want is you not to have your stinking feet in that forest land to pollute it. Because they believe you are the problem. You are the polluter. You are pollution. You need to be put together in your compact cities and then exterminated on cue so that you can't breed. And that's how they think. And these people are all on the left. Make no mistake. There is not one person that is a conservative or, you know, Bible-believing, walking with the Lord, that is a leftist, that, that, in other words, who wants eugenics and genocide. Not one. But, Z, there are people that are atheists who claim to be conservative. Oh, well, then you find me one that's involved in eugenics. I don't think you'll find one. You know, from Margaret Sanger and all the rest of the, uh, the, the death cult people, uh, um, all these people would be considered leftists, Marxists, whatever. Ultimately, the war is against humanity itself. Ultimately, they are in league with the devil, period. Spiritually, the signature is they serve Satan. That's their God. Their job is to destroy all humanity on earth. Game over. And in exchange for that, Satan will give them the riches and powerful positions that the world has to offer. And they'll be able to engorge themselves on pleasure while they're here. Sexual, food, flying around in jets, or whatever it is. And, and they'll be able to engorge themselves with, with food and wine and women, or men, or whatever it is. Whatever pleasure they have, um, ultimately they, that won't do it for them. They have to start killing people and killing in order to get an orgasm. But that's an advanced case. That's when it, that's when it gets really bad. You can't really uh, get through the day without a snuff film or something, uh, or else you can't get off. Once it gets to that level, um, and, oh, those people would be at the top because they can do things like that where the plane goes down, they have a videotape of it, and they watch it, and they, they orgasm over it, over, over the trauma. Who orgasms or is satisfied over the trauma of people? Exactly right, the demonic realm, the demons get extreme satisfaction out of traumatizing and, and or perverting or you know, bringing immorality to people and perversion and ultimately um, sadism and, and you know, that, that sort of thing, you know, being cruel, cruelty, and ultimately you know, death. And as people are dying or being hurt, it's the demons in them that get titillated over, um, you know, uh, torturing the victims in the jail or whatever it is. And the demonic realm gets all stoked up over that. Well, when they go down that path, they get an appetite because it's really not them they're feeding with that appetite. They're feeding the demon that lives within them. So are you saying that the world leaders are demonically possessed? Well, if the shoe fits, how else are you going to get to be a world leader? You know, if I'm demon-possessed and I'm, you know, running the world from my sector of Earth and you want to run something else and I have the power to appoint you to a, another position of power and you don't have the same demon I've got, then I, believe me, you're not in. I've got to look for someone that's got the same thing going on I've got inside and then that's the person that's going to get hired. Not you. Unless it's, you know... A Joseph in Pharaoh's court, which means the Pharaoh is very desperate at that point. That happens too. Yes, I, the, yes, I've, I've, the the lambs walk around on the earth, and God, Psalm twenty-three, makes a table 
for them in the midst of their enemies, where the enemies or the demon, demonically possessed people are all around. Most of them are hypnotized, traumatized, possessed, and they don't even know their own name. They're just like name, rank, and serial. You know, they, the, the, the tapes that spew out of their mouth are just like pre-written recordings that they, so they, they don't like you, even though you're nice to them and you, you're loving to them and you're helpful to them. And they bark back like angry dogs, you know, jealous of your freedom or, or whatever, or just angry that you, you're not one of them and we can't have, everyone's gotta be one of us on this planet. You're not one of us, we're gonna stick Janet Napolitano on them. Got it? Now for the word. I always like to lay that foundation. A little politics, a little word, spiritual. I want to show how it all connects. And then now I've established that, uh, the basic truth of the situation on earth. And make no mistake, the left-handed path, wherever it is, you cannot blend a little collectivism with Jesus, with the Bible. It doesn't work. When I see people doing that, I just know they're not in Christ. They're just fooling themselves. They're, they're playing a game with themselves. They're in denial. Well, what about fairness? You know, making sure that we all have a shot. Oh yeah, Obama says that rhetoric, but they don't mean it. They are up there as elites. And all the elites are really leftists. And what they want to do is make sure that Nobody has a shot, but they always give that rhetoric, and that rhetoric is a way to put a gun to people's head and get tax money out of them so they can lavish themselves all the more and, and lavish themselves with jets and power and wars and whatever these stupid elites do, you know? That whatever they want to do, they usually like to have war and caviar and sex and youth and whatnot, and, uh, and to hell with you. You are all my slaves. You work for me. That's the way it is in every despot dictatorship there is. And the dictator is going to be good to the little people. And the little people love their servitude. And they love to be taken care of by the dictator. And it's just sick. I mean, people are just, you know, they just give up. That's why America is special, because it didn't do that. And that's what distinguishes America from Europe, from everywhere else in the world. And people say, oh, America's no, the, here's the left's big thing now. Oh, America's not what it used to be. You know, even people like uh, great uh, businessmen, investors like Jim Rogers, who's like a hedge fund guy. He was, I think, at one time in partnership with George Soros, if I'm not mistaken. I, I may be mistaken on that. He moved his whole family to the Philippines. Yeah, because he says this, the, the, the Asian century comes next. America's in decline. And I'm here to say, um, no, not so fast. Nothing in Asia is like America. Nothing in Europe is like America. And it just ain't over yet. I know people say, this is it, it's over, you know. They're waiting to be picked up by the Jesus bus. And I'm just here to say, well, don't miss out on your life. You know, I'm, it's kind of like, um, you know, Steve Quayle, a guy used to be on the air. I, I guess he's still on the air. I'm sorry. And um, he would tell people to, uh, you know, move out of uh, the Gulf because 100 million people are going to die down there. Or some kind of thing with the, the oil spill, right? And a lot of people moved hearing his radio station and they they gathered all this survival gear and food for the next 20 years and they moved into like, you know, these hovels, you know, out of their homes where they had economic you know, activity and whatnot and sold everything to get out of harm's way because they felt the earth was going to be chewed up right there. And when it didn't come to pass, the guy took no responsibility, as none of them do. None of them do. They just keep making one jerk-off prediction after another. And, and what ends up happening is nothing. And then all the people that rearrange their lives around that whole situation, they all lose their faith in God because, you know, after all, 
you know, it didn't happen or something. And I'm here to tell you that life is a mystery. The word of God is a mystery, which is the word of God. God is a mystery, which is the word of God is a mystery, which is God, the word of God, a mystery. It's never going to be anything other than that. My life, being that it emanated from the word of God, you know, in other words, God spoke it into existence, or the word, of God, the word spoke me into, or if you like, Jesus created me, if you like, Jesus created all people, uh, but people knew him not. Whatever you want to say, John 1, by the way. So, <laughs> So I, a manifestation of the word of God, am a mystery. My life, as it unfolds, is a mystery unto me. And the key is, the more mysterious I leave it, the more understanding I have. I'm not going to repeat that, but you, you get the gist of it, right? The more mysterious that I leave it, the more clarity I have. Because ultimately, I am. Well, if I am, then I am a mystery. I am hidden, protected, and yet visible. I am a paradox. But I am ultimately, I am, which is a solid state of perfection. Though I'm in this manifestation of a fallen, flawed human. But my flaws ultimately become part of the whole or the wedding, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb, consummated as one, meaning I am, meaning there never was a fallen thing, though there is. You see, and this gets into the paradoxes and then the stuff that the people in the East and, you know, mystics and whatnot ponder these things. For some people spend their whole life pondering those paradoxes. If it's perfection and all is love in the end, how can we berate ourselves with focusing on the negative when we also do good things? The flesh profits nothing, they'll say. None of my, my best works are still filthy rags under the Lord. Yes, when you say they're your works, separate from God, automatically you've tainted them by saying they're separate from God, which... They couldn't be because nothing is separate from God. So ultimately, you know, everything that happens is his will anyway. And he is perfect and God. So therefore, there really is no fall. But there is in the sense that we're living it and going through the emotions of feeling like we're fallen and need to be redeemed and rescued, which we do. But ultimately, all is all right anyway. And all is the word of God. So nothing really is outside God's will to begin with. And could not be. Furthermore, God knew Adam would fall because without that there would be no uh, Bible, no journey, no quest from flesh to spirit, no conundrum, no mystery. No life. There would be no life without the um, conflict of opposites. Fallen versus grace versus truth versus righteousness versus, versus sacredness versus profane and profanity versus good versus bad. Without these, these conflicts of opposites, there could be no actual existence of beings walking around on a planet. So we put up with this so that we can have this experience. Otherwise, we couldn't. Because we need light and dark, you know, good and evil. The mystery of good and evil is that through this concept, beyond the concept of good and evil, equals life. Right? God is truth, is love, equals life. But to do that, he must divide himself into dark and light, which are both illusions, but if all one perceives is just light, uh, there would be no darkness or, or there would be no awareness of darkness. There would be an amorphous uh, state of unknowing self, of unself 
or separate consciousness, which is required for life. Right? Things have to have an identity, you know, from the moose to the cat to the human, right? There's a self, say, there's a diversity of beings, which couldn't be unless God divides himself. Otherwise, it's just I am amorphous. Amorphous meaning compared to what? Meaning uh, mystery, incomparable, uh, in, unknowable, and invisible. Visible and invisible, but unknowable, un unsearchable, un unfathomable. To be fathomable, what is it? Huh? Oh, don't chase that cricket. Crickets are fun. Crickets are good, Lost. Get out of there. Come on. That's my, f yeah. Cr hey, enough of with the cricket. No, let me keep the cricket here. And so, uh, so, okay, oh, he embraces the idea of existence, the idea of the, that, that, you know, uh, that there is a way to manipulate uh, through good and evil, through the opposites to produce results in nature, taking advantage of the science or magic of the, of the opposites, to be able to be as gods and to be able to create like a god and to be able to assign himself god status. And in order to do this, he embraces the light and the dark together as one of course, this is ancient knowledge and it's a ancient truth. It's veiled to the, the mere outsider and the people that have a, a grasp of this truth. They're the ones who can really wield the power upon the earth. And this has been the whole conundrum because, you know, the bottom line is they can't ever really be God. So they self-destruct from time to time. In their quest for power, they burn. I think the whole images of hell as a fire and brimstone came from sorcerers literally spontaneously combusting. And from time to time, that would literally happen to them. Or they would inflict this kind of thing on someone else and they're able to cause other people to just burn and then pain and torture yielding some kind of power result that they could then put in the bank and then they could wield that against another person or, you know, and it always, then it started becoming like, I gotta put as many people down as possible. I gotta control them with neuro-linguistic programming so I can boost myself to really show I'm an adept at wielding the forces of Lucifer seething in my hands the two opposites together in one vessel, but not short-circuiting, propelling me to godhood. And that's intoxicating. And, it's, and they burn, you know, eventually. Because everyone will reap what they sow. Now, God hates that. and wants us to understand our position, i.e. weak, and seek him for redress, for counsel, for guidance, and for help, that we can do nothing on our own. The whole idea that the sorcerer can wield the opposites through the seething powers of Lucifer is but a lie to begin with. God allows them to, to manipulate a few things and to get a little power, get the third eye going and all that, to be able to you know, make people uh, you know, have control over people or throw whammies on them, whatever. He allows it to a certain extent as an indictment against them and then says, for this, 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 and this, you're going to burn, bang, and he just exterminates them on the spot. Believe me, I know, I've seen them exterminated and they just go boom like that in the grave. Gaunch. Yeah. 
fleeting. You know, they're here for five minutes, boom, gone. They want to wield this power. But no matter where you are on the totem pole, you have to realize, especially people that have wealth or businesses or whatever, you have to realize that none of that comes from you. All that comes from God. And that, you know, seeking what His will in these matters makes one wise, not coming up with something on your own, like that idiot Obama. Sorry, shouldn't say idiot, I'll say like that ignorant man, Obama, who is now possessed with, they're putting all their hopes and dreams on him that he can bring forth the uh, World War III and, uh, you know, and beat the restrainer this time, like he did with health care or health care. Health care is basically just um, destruction of wealth and... Uh, it doesn't take. It won't take care of anybody in the end. He just pays people to vote his way, and then once he gets what he wants, he'll kill them. That's what these 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 people are kind of boring in the sense that they do the same thing every generation, all the way back in time to the beginning of time. They're very predictable. Uh, he's the guy du jour. We had Bush before, and he was compromised to the hilt, and then we had you know Clinton, and he was. They're all part of the same secret society, Bush, Clinton, and Obama, and they're all kind of in the same club. And um, you can see as Clinton is aging, he's looking more and more pathetic, more and more feeble, and kind of, you know, he's... I think what happens to these people is they get this, this disease, dementia. A, a lot of it, you know, senility and all that. Well, a lot of it is just when you have a reprobate mind, it, it, it tends to go there. The people I know that are really strong in the Word of God and just really kind of disciplined in their walk and their faith and, and whatnot, I don't see them getting senile or I don't see, they just become beautiful spirits in the end. I mean, they just become more and more Christ, more and more perfect. They don't start, they don't have those um, problems that are so prevalent in the world today. You know, the same thing with the AMA and cancer and all this stuff. They don't, they, People that are of God, they don't tend to worry about those things and they don't tend to get all upset about whether or not they can... I mean, they understand that going to the AMA for help is pretty much a, a committing suicide. Not all the time, but I mean, you, you know, unless you're... You wouldn't want to make a habit of it. Um, you, you know, you definitely want to be led by the Lord on, on issues like health care. Now they're going to make people buy health care and, and they just figure there'll be about four or five million people in America who will opt to pay the penalty rather than actually having health care. And um, the whole idea of causing a penalty is completely unconstitutional and anti-Christ. Um, uh, and the, the production of more IRS agents that will terrorize the people is tyranny. Um, the idea that there would be people voting for this, and, and you see them and their foul spirits and their ugliness and their stu stupid way of talking and, they, and they, um, the, the, the way that they behave, and you know, it's just it's so anathema to me, I just can't even imagine. You know, is there no such thing as self-reliance anymore? We're just going to all be, I think we should all just be put in diapers, don't you? I think that in the nanny state, we should all just be put in diapers and all made infantile like our leaders are infantile. Leftists are infantile. And, and you know, they don't know where money comes from. They don't, they don't know anything, really. Um, and we could all just be like, you know, babies being taken care of by mommy in our diapers and on our conveyor belts on our way into the oven. And, you know, I, I, I know that sounds really extreme, but believe it when I say it, that's ultimately, even if they won't be honest with themselves, that's ultimately what they want. Instead of ever having human beings come to adulthood, they should just kill them as babies. And it doesn't stop there. And that's why we fight against them. Because they don't know that what they're doing is suicide for us all. Now, the word is that there's a restoration 
and an upwelling of knowledge and a rima that's being shared amongst the beloved brethren, when the people are being changed and they're almost being made superhuman. Uh, it's hard to explain, you know, it's somewhere in the DNA being activated in that way. You know, the other side says their same thing's happening with their new age sorcerers or whatever, but there is this sort of activation going on and there is kind of a restoration or some kind of a respite because there's been a punishment for the last 20, 30 years and uh, that people don't even know what normal would be. They only know being oppressed and this thing lifts and some people will really soar uh, joyously because the whole point of the restoration of this thing is to go above the fray, above where Satan can touch you and exist there in that state of love on this plane, walking around, can you imagine? Untouchable. And so it doesn't matter what your economy is or your government or whatever, it's, it's that's what I'm talking about. As far as the United States and the whole, you know, the secret societies having a grip on it and the uh, foul architecture of Washington, D.C., showing their gods and who they worship and how they worship Satan and all that, um, you could just sweep that off the table. You're, you're, it's less important to you about their architecture and their obelisks and their, and their pentagrams and whatnot. You, 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 they don't touch you. You don't really exist there. You're there now to minister unto those who are ignorant, which would be the most ignorant would be the people at the top. And as you go down the scale in power, um, you get more and more people that know a little of what's going on. They don't seem to know the whole thing. You see a lot of people that say, I'm a truther, I'm into truth, but I reject Christ. And I'm like, well, then you're not into truth, obviously. So when you, whenever you wake up, let me know. Or I'm into truth, and then they accept socialism or something. It's like, no, if you were into truth, you would understand that is a lie. It's based on a lie. It will only lead to, ultimately, failure and destruction. Can I blend in uh, freedom and free markets with freedom from God? Yes, I can. I can make that distinction between economies that a free market is of God and that a, uh, a collective is not. Yes, I can make that distinction and I just have. And I've proven it beyond any argument. The arguments I make cannot be broken in any way, shape or form. Oh, people can speak and blather on, but uh, it doesn't really address the fact that it is what it is. You know what I mean? It is what it is. You know, it's, I'm not going to call it something other than what it is. It's just, you know, the, the truth is what it is. There will be no Jesus bus in the way they think, but people do get translated. However, this kind of rescue thing of the, you know, I'm going to rescue the bride over here and we're going to go up in the air and you know, it's all going to be cool. The tables will be flipped. I mean, it's really good. Believe me, I'd love to see that. But it wouldn't be true to say it. What's happening is that there's this change or restoration which could be construed as meeting the Lord in the air. But you're still here. And even if they kill you, you're above that, you see. You don't really die. I mean, you know, you go through the... It, it's, it's not like there's a fear thing. You're not tethered. Yeah, I know you're feeling this. You're not tethered to the, to the things you were tethered to, to the fears and hang-ups and this and that. There's this kind of arrival at a certain point in consciousness that is not where the world is and yet is above it and yet you can minister to it and, and where you are, you would never say you were above it. It's above it in the sense that love is higher than hatred. Light is higher than darkness. In being in love is higher than being out of love. 
And that is what is going to happen. Along with that, there will be the opposite things happening on the other side, a lot more darkness and bad things happening in attendance with these things that are miraculous and supernatural in terms of the restoration and uplift into the different soul track, if you will, different dimension. And on the other side, there's going to be a big pulling down to equalize out that welling up. So you can expect more tyranny, more destruction, more wars to accommodate this breaking free and the first fruits being the lambs who are really lions in terms of sovereignty, meaning they can go anywhere on the earth they like, bar nowhere, and have this, uh, uh, and those, the demonic spirits back off in fear because you have the power to extinguish them on sight. Lambs become lions. Bullies become cowards. So to get back in their bullyhood, they do bad things. But the war ramps up. Anyway, these opposites are always, there's always equilibrium balancing out. It's part of the mystery of God. So the whole idea of the Jesus bus is that when things get so bad that it can't go on anymore, there'll be a supernatural event that will deliver the Church of Christ out sparing it from the tortures and pain and suffering of this world, which makes tremendous sense to me. Tremendous sense. Um, but the focusing on a time, date, or event, and, uh, you know, um, kind of like a left-behind scenario, is, uh, would lead to disappointment. Wouldn't you rather be transformed completely into no fear of death and wouldn't that be eternal life? No matter what form you took on? What I'm talking about is a feeling. A feeling of invincibility. Of confidence. Of love, joy, satisfaction, um, euphoria. Energy, euphoria. What they tried to get out of MDMA, <laughs> but failed. And in that weakness of being open and love, there is invincibility. It's not something you can produce. The love and light people try to be, oh, I love you, I love, love, love. They try to kind of force it. And it's just something that has to happen to you. You can't do it to yourself. And you can't do it to another person like the sorcerers try to do. You must receive it. And you can't control it. You can't put it in a box. You can't have your way with it. All you can do is receive it and run with it like a kid. Oh, cool! That's it. And that will be happening over the next few months, and um, I say that's good news. With that, I will be uh, taking off. This is Zeph Daniel of the Zeph Report, who's been on hiatus. He has been on hiatus. Um... There's just been a lot of things to uh, that I've kind of involved in, and I don't know why I'm on high. I don't really know what the schedule is. I know that um, a lot of people want to know collectively what the heck is going on on this earth. They want to know what's going on. <clears throat> they want to know prophetically why they have mixed signals on every possible direction. Why there is such confusion in the body of Christ, which is supposed to be truth and leading into truth, and from one truth to another to greater truth, and why that's not happening. And I'm saying it is happening. You're just not understanding that you are a mystery. 
just like it is a mystery. And you can't figure it out. And that's the way it's designed, silly. It's designed for you not to figure it out. But it's already figured out in you, so there's peace. I know. I, look, if I could have a linear answer to this, I would be answering the, the question of the ages that, that gave rise to all the Deepak Chopras and Dwayne Dwyers or Dyers or whatever these kind of like uh, self-help, Tony Robbins and all. I would be able to answer the, th the quest they've all had, <clears throat> which is how can we have quality, you know, wealth, sustenance, health, happiness in this life? Even, and it's like, well, there's not, you know, from my eternal perspective, it's like, well, there's, you don't have a lot of time to get all that. So, you know, by the time you get to be old, you finally figured out how to live so you have some joy and it's over. You know, it's, it's just is the way it is. It's, it's incredible. God doesn't want you to play God. So that quest should be out. The quest for health, wealth, happiness and all that will lead to sorrow and um, confusion. Rather, seek the kingdom first, and the things you want, including all those answers, will be added unto you. Just seek to be in his light and just go, baby, you know? There's no wrong way. Don't let a preacher tell you there's a wrong way. Understand? They'll tell you, you got to live like this. I got off alcohol, now you get off. The Lord delivered me from alcohol, now you get off. It's a sin, smoking, get off, uh, whatever. Um, I don't need someone to tell me that because I already know that, you know, um, things like getting drunk, uh, lusting, coveting, Jealousy, envy, all those things are sins. I, you know what? I think I got that. Because I think I feel bad when I, you know, carnality is kind of a sin, right? Identifying with your carnal self and then you have the power or not the power. I don't have any power. I've got nothing, but I have him. I'm weak, I have him and he's strong. He's so strong, he's stronger than anything on earth. So I'm gonna push into that and then the things I need, strength, which I don't have right now, he will give me enough for everything. And in Jesus' name, I bid you shalom and blessing and uh, the power of the Spirit. Amen.